Hi, I'm Chris Cooper. Welcome to The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Thanks for joining us. Urban foresters promote healthy urban and community forests, which contribute to clean air and water and provide beautiful green places in which all of us live, work, and play. If this sounds like something you'd like to be involved in, stay with us because Jim Vogus is here to tell us about an exciting opportunity to learn more about urban forestry. And Mr. D is here with advice on controlling deer, rabbits, and other critters that may be damaging your garden. All that and more is just ahead on The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, so stay with us. This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Jim Vogus. Mr. Vogus is a certified arborist and master gardener right here in Sherby County. Hi, Chris. And Mr. D is here. Thanks Glad for here. joining me. Glad to be here. Okay. All right, Mr. Vogus, let's talk a little bit about the urban forester class. All right. What do we need to know? This is a class that's conducted at least once a year, sometimes twice a year. It is conducted by the West Tennessee chapter of the Urban Forestry Council and also the Memphis Botanic Garden. These are classes that are held at the Botanic Garden on Wednesday mornings, mm -hmm. and we'll be starting the first Wednesday in September. Okay, who can attend? Well, actually the class is designed for anybody. We started mm -hmm. out making it a certification type class, but we invite anybody in the public Anybody who has a tree in their front yard <laughs> or who is interested in the trees in their neighborhood. Uh, we particularly like to get in municipal workers, park workers, tree board members, city beautiful, uh, city uh -huh. commission okay. type people, but virtually anybody that's interested in trees. Okay, so homeowners or professionals. Right. It sounds like. Right. Okay. As long as they're interested in trees. This is for my tree hugger. <laughs> All right, so what will you learn when you take this course? Actually, the course is pretty comprehensive. <clears throat> At the tree level, you will learn all about how trees work. You'll learn the language of trees. You will learn how to plant them properly. You'll learn how to prune them properly. You'll learn how to uh, prune them, uh, plant them, like I say, how to water them, how to take care of them in general. You'll also learn how to ID trees. Mm -hmm. You'll learn <clears throat> something about common diseases and pests that attack trees. You'll learn something about identifying tree hazards and just about anything to do with an individual tree that you can imagine. At the community level, you will learn about how urban forestry really uh, evolved through the ages and how we are at the point where we are now where urban forestry is a uh, fast growing discipline Wow. And it's how to take care of the trees in the neighborhood, in the parks, on the right-of-ways, uh, in your schoolyards. Uh, for example, if you have an indoor, I mean, an outdoor classroom at a school, how to take care of those trees. Mm. But it's on a, more of a community level. Wow, that sounds like some good stuff. I see Mr. Indeed. D over there. Uh, well, that, that's, why, that's why it's a five-week course, four hours each, each uh, Wednesday. So it makes for a 20-hour course. Wow. And they will learn, too, that it's not digging a hole, but preparing a site. There you go, Chris. That's what it is? Okay. <laughs> uh, who are some of the instructors? Well, all of the instructors are local, and all of us have taught this course uh, several times before. Uh, everybody is a, a certified arborist and or a certified forester okay. and or... A, a certified master, master gardener right. and or a certified... <laughs> Uh, master urban forester, but everybody is very knowledgeable in their field and anxious to tell people about it. Okay. Now, what does it mean to be a certified arborist? 
Well, the certification is is available. Oh, you mean a certified arborist? Yeah, certified arborist. A certified arborist is a person with uh, at least two to three years experience in the field of taking care of trees, and uh, uh, you have to take an exam. Mm. There's there's eleven parts to the exam. You have to pass that exam, and then you get your certification. Mm. Which, like most uh, professional organizations. You have continuing education that you have to take, mm -hmm. and uh, just about every one of the instructors are certified arborists yeah. as well as other things. Okay, and so now let's talk about the certification that's available. Well, the certification is available for those students who wish to be certified. Also, there's some companies that will pay the, the fee for the course if you're working toward this certification. The certification will require you to take a final exam mm. and will require 20 years of volunteer, I'm sorry, 20 <laughs> hours, 20 hours yeah. of volunteer work in the urban forestry right. area. And there's opportunities just abound. They're, they're all over the place. There are right. cemeteries, parks with the, with the city, uh, you name it. Right, and hopefully you can do this for the next 20 years. Yes. Now, that would be good. So how do you apply uh, for this course, uh, for this class? Uh, the application and a flyer are available from the Botanic Garden and also the Master Gardener office mm -hmm. at the UT Extension office. Uh, if you will call Lori Williams mm -hmm. at, the, at the Botanic Garden, and her number is 636-4128. Now, I repeat that. 636-4128 and Lori can answer any questions that you may have in regards to this program and she will also send you the flyer and the application. Okay, uh, is there a fee? Uh, yes, okay. there's, it's an $85 okay. fee and the $85 covers the whole 20 hour course. Okay. It uh, pays for the materials and also pays for one year membership in the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council. Okay. Wow. I think that's going to be well worth it. Yeah, I've actually had a chance to sit through a lot of those classes and learned a lot about tree and tree care. There, there is a limited number of openings in this class mm. and most everybody signs up the last two or three weeks. <laughs> so by the time this program airs, you better make the call. Now, now tell me this and tell our people this as well. How did you get interested uh, in trees? I mean, why did you want to become a certified arborist? That's an interesting story. Of course, <laughs> the fact that I came from the Pacific Northwest kind of helped, but when I became a master gardener mm -hmm. and people start talking about what their favorite plant is, and I had a hard time thinking through <laughs> that, and I finally decided, well, it's trees. So I got interested in trees and started working at Elmwood, doing volunteer work at Elmwood mm -hmm. and Botanic Garden at the Dixon. and it led to wanting to become a certified arborist, so I studied for that and became a certified arborist. But it's just my interest in trees ever since I was a kid growing up in Oregon. Wow, don't you just admire that? Pretty neat. Yeah, pretty I, neat. I, I think that's pretty good. Do you have a favorite tree or you just like all trees? Bald cypress. Bald cypress? In, in this area, bald cypress or a ginkgo. Right, either one. Wow, well look, Mr. Bogus, we actually appreciate that information. Thank you. All right, thank you for the opportunity. Okay. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. All right, Mr. D, before we get started with controlling the critters, we have a viewer email, okay? On a recent show, you talked about wet worm control and named a lot of pesticides to get rid of them. Years ago, I had a big problem with wet worms in a pecan tree. I took the advice of an old neighbor and sprayed all the wells with strong apple cider. Before long, yellow jackets showed up attracted by the cider. They discovered the caterpillars inside, and within two days, hordes of yellow jackets had devoured every one of those caterpillars. And we also talked about trying to control or get rid of chipmunks. 
I had chipmunks last year that made cuts in my butternut squashes. This year, the chipmunks were digging in all my flower pots before the garden was in full swing. A rat snake showed up and made short work of the chipmunks. I've had no more problems with rodents in the garden. And this is from Warren up in Millington. So Mr. D, what comments do you have after reading this from Warren in Millington? <laughs> I'd say Warren is pretty smart. I'd say smart Warren guy, is Mr. Warren. Smart. Like I always say, if, if something works for you, continue doing it. Mm -hmm. And that makes perfect sense to me, uh, uh, especially the rat snake yeah. controlling yeah, yeah. chipmunks. I mean, uh, I mean, they're called rat snakes. That doesn't mean they just eat rats. They <laughs> right. eat mice. They eat chipmunks. They eat anything they can catch. And, and the bigger the better. Right. The bigger the snake, the better. The more they can eat, and the right. more they need. And I think that's a great idea. So do not, you know, don't kill chicken snakes. We that's a yeah. common name for for a rat snake, gray rat snake. Uh, leave them be because they do a lot more good than they do harm. Yes. They don't do any harm at yeah, all. They help you out in the garden yeah, too. They, they will. They do. They do a lot of good. And then the the webworm control that makes perfect sense. I mean, even if you can go in there and just just tear that web up. Yeah. Uh, so that the predators, birds, birds. birds can get to yeah. those caterpillars, that will help take care of them. But uh, I wonder, I just, I guess I'm curious as to how, it, how putting that apple cider on the web, how that, how that made that yellow jacket able to get into that web, unless they just were still, you know, they would keep trying to penetrate the web to get to the last of the apple cider and found right. a nice juicy yeah, I worm about in that. there. You're but right. I mean, I wonder, and, and I also wonder, uh, it's a bring, you need to do more research, I wonder uh -huh. if lemonade would work. I wonder if sugar water would, would work. Yeah. You know, I wonder yeah. if other things like that that attract, I mean, Coca-Cola, Yellow yeah. Jackets like, you know, soft drinks and things like that. I yeah. wonder if any of that would work. Uh, but it makes perfect sense, Warren, and I congratulate you on figuring out how to take care of a couple of our most common pests. All right, there you go, Mr. Warren, from Mr. D himself. All right, let's 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 talk about deer and rabbit control. Did you want to add something else? I was going to say, you might want to contact UT and see if they'll be interested in putting that in the Red Book. Yeah. Hey, how about I that? Know, huh? might want to do that. <laughs> we might need to check that out. All right. All right, now deer and rabbit control. My goodness, because uh, I don't think there's going to be a snake big enough to take care of our deer. Right. That's not, I mean, they have some down in South Florida that might. Oh but, boy. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, I'm back to my 12-year-old with a. <laughs> got to up the ante. You got to have yeah. more than a more than a, a BB gun. Oh yeah. You're probably going to need a, a 20 gauge shotgun or uh, something like that to control deer and rabbits. Uh, they they. I guess I, I'm going to start off by telling you what will control them, or how you can best control them and then I, and if we have time I want to give you some interesting facts about okay. especially deer. Now and the thing about deer now before we go further this is only during hunting season right for deer we're not gonna be we can't shoot the deer all season long. No but I'm gonna talk about okay. you know maybe how we can control the deer uh, using uh, exclusion fences and mm -hmm. things like that and, and you can the same thing for deer and rabbits electric fences work great and you know I've learned that out here at Agri Center. Uh, we yeah. do a lot of plot work uh, in the job that I currently have, and, and we, uh, in the last few years, we have so many deer and, and rabbits and groundhogs and things like really? that that we've learned that uh, electric fences do a pretty good job. Now, it's important that you, uh, and that's cost you a little bit of money, but it's something that you can reuse. If you have a real problem with deer and getting in your garden, and now if it's just getting in your yard, and eating your ornamentals and things yeah, like that. I don't know whether you want to <laughs> put an electric fence around your entire yard or not. You probably don't want to do that. But, but uh, we uh, are successful in keeping deer out of our plots to, to have uh, just a couple of electric fence wires, you know, one at about, you know, four feet and mm -hmm. one at about two feet and have it angled out at about a 45 degree angle with an electric fence charger that will charge an electric fence about 20 miles long. Oh. And you know, <laughs> oh. the high powered <laughs> yeah. electric fence charger. <clears throat> but yep. you can do the same thing with, with uh, rabbits. Now to keep rabbits out though, you need a couple of uh, wires and the bottom wire needs yeah. to be like three inches off the ground. Three inches off the ground, so that means you're going so to have to lay down. Crawl uh, under, yeah, where they under. can't get under. That means you're going to have to use uh, Roundup or something and you know, keep the, right. the foliage from coming out. Right. But, and then another one that is about, you know, six or eight inches off the ground. So you got you have two wires both in both cases and, and then follow the directions uh, on <laughs> installing that electric fence and be sure that you turn it off before you start messing with it. Right, sure. Oh my because goodness. Because it will uh, it'll almost make you uh, you know forget your memory. You know there are other things uh, there are uh, uh, 
products that you can buy that supposedly repel rabbits and deer. You put it on the foliage that they eat that yeah. are pepper based and different product based that might give you some temporary yeah. relief. Uh, the uh, naphthalene moth crystals mm. for rabbits, you know, might give you some temporary relief, but th for long-term relief, uh, uh, electric fences and during hunting season <laughs> in areas that you can hunt, uh, take them out, folks. The, you know, a rabbit can produce six litters per year and they have two to three wow. rabbits mm. per litter. Mm. So you can start with two rabbits oh. and in just a short while, you can have lots of rabbits. Deer, most, if, if, if deer are getting enough to eat, mm. most female deer will, ha will, deer will have twins. Mm. And so you don't just double your population in one year. You can you more than double your population in one year. Deer are very territorial. They won't leave their territory even if they're starving to death. Wow. They will stay in an area. And in the forest, you see that uh, the, there will be a browse line. Yeah, I've you can seen kind that. of bend over it and you can see mm. that there's nothing no twigs, no branches, no anything below a certain height. And you'd, th you'd think they'd be smart enough to go to move out of there if right. there's nothing to eat, but they don't. They'll stay there until they until they develop uh, chronic wasting disease. There are wow. several diseases that that uh, animals get when they get overpopulated. Hunting, folks, is is one of the best wildlife yeah. management tools that we have. Uh, there aren't a lot of natural predators for for deer. Man is is the best. Wow. And I've seen a lot of deer out at the Agri Center too. Yeah, deer cost us about $4 billion a year. There are 200 people a year killed uh, deer car collisions wow. in this country. Mm. And uh, the population is right at between 20 and 30 million deer. Wow. In 1980, it was 10 million a year. So it's a growing problem. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. Wow, oh, man. Well, we got rid of the natural predators. Yeah. So. And so, wolves and, yeah. yeah. So like we that. need we so. need people predators. Yeah, like you were saying. All right, <laughs> thanks for the information, Mr. D. Now is our Q&A session, and Mr. Vogel, you jump in there with us, all right? Uh, here's our first uh, viewer email from Kathleen. She writes, can anyone please tell me the name of the plant in the picture? All right, Ms. Kathleen, that will be your swamp rose mallow. I figured you could figure yeah, that out. Yeah, it grows in uh, wet areas. It, you know, it grows in ditches, uh, by ponds, shorelines. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a perennial, it's a pretty, pretty tall plant. You know, it can grow pretty quickly, uh, likes full sun. Uh, it's in a mallow family, of course. Um, actually, hummingbirds like to visit uh, this plant and bumblebees for the nectar. Uh, it is a native plant. You know, it's a Tennessee native plant. Uh, but yeah, it can get about eight feet tall. Uh, but hmm. again, loves wet areas, beautiful bloom. Um, so that would be your rose swamp mallow. Okay. That's Mr. D writes that down. I'm writing it down, but I didn't know. <laughs> That's what that I knew, is. I knew that I had to be very confident that you would know that. <laughs> All right, there you go, Miss Kathleen. Rose swamp mallow. Okay. Here's our next question. Why is my squash not producing? The blooms just keep falling off. What do you think about that one, Mr. D? I think we got a pollination issue there. That's what I think. You? Yeah, I think the same thing. Uh, first blooms on a squash plant, aren't they usually the male blooms? They're usually the males. They fall off anyway, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's, that's natural. Mm -hmm. But, uh, uh, you know, then another thing is, is you don't want to be applying, you know, a lot of pesticides no. when, when, they're, when they're blooming because that can take out your pollinating yeah. insects. And, uh, but, but that's probably your, your, your issue when you think. Yeah, I think it's uh, yeah, a lack of uh, pollinators, uh, definitely. Um, Cause yeah, your male blooms on there first and then of course, here comes the female blooms. You can tell it's the female because at the base of the female is a small uh, embryonic fruit that mm -hmm. resembles, you know, squash. of course the squash. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, if it's not pollinated then that will fall off. Right. So yeah, either get your bees out there or Q-tip. Do the pollination yourself. Do the pollination yourself. Do yeah, the that's kind of a slow, <laughs> tedious process. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Make your neighbor it. start talking about yeah, it. Yeah, you're going to have to explain <laughs> that one to your neighbor, yeah. But a uh, Q-tip or a small, fine paintbrush and kind of go back and forth between the male and female. And uh, I guess blossom end rot is another thing that's pretty common. <laughs> and uh, that's usually because the pH is, is uh, too low. You mm -hmm. need to add lime to your soil. 
Mm -hmm. they, they need more calcium. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's our next question, and this is always uh, oldie but goodie. It <laughs> says, can Mr. D please cover again the differences between a vole and a mole? Uh, what do they like to eat, and what about the control? I can. I can. And then we'll start with the mole. Let's start with the mole. Mole is a uh, critter that is uh, carnivorous. It only eats insects or insect larvae okay. or earthworms. Okay. And it prefers earthworms. It does not do any, it, it doesn't eat roots. It doesn't eat any yeah. plant material. And I don't think it likes juicy fruit chewing gum. <laughs> but uh, they do, uh, they, you know, one mole can tunnel up to 250, 225, 250 feet in one night. So they do a lot of tunneling. Yes, they're voracious right. feeders, and they're usually only a problem in a yard that's got a lot of organic matter and a lot of earthworms. Mm -hmm. So if you have a lot of moles, you probably have a very healthy mm -hmm. ecosystem in your soil. Mm -hmm. The best way to control them is with a trap. Right. And you just find a place a trap over a tunnel that's being used for transportation, and you'll catch them. Mm -hmm. Caught 14 last year. I've caught seven this year so wow. far. Ooh. I use the scissors type trap and I've been very successful with that. Uh -huh. That is the only type trap that I personally have been successful right. with. I've had a harpoon type that I've never caught up, not one mole with. So I'm obviously not using that, I am obviously not using that harpoon <laughs> type trap correctly. correctly right. <laughs> but, uh, but mole trapping is, is, according to the Red Book, that's mm -hmm. the best way to control them. We don't recommend using insecticides because insecticides kill insects, they'll kill grub worms, yeah. but it's not gonna kill the earthworms. It's not going to help the earthworms, but it's probably not going to kill the earthworms, and you're going to continue to have the problem. So right. I, I don't think uh, using insecticides to control molds is going to help. And, and I usually tell people, too, and I, and I saw Mr. Vogels over here nodding his head, uh, it just means you have a, a, a good uh, soil it's environment. Good soil. Yeah. Right. That's, that's correct. That's what that is. That's correct. Voles, on the Voles. other hand, uh, <laughs> voles are, uh, they feed on plant material. They're, they're omnivores or, or more herbivores. Mm -hmm. They like to feed on, and during this time of the year, they're feeding on grass, clip, you know, little tender grass shoots and little weeds and things like that. They come out of the ground, and but they they do not hibernate. So during the winter time, they feed on roots. Mm -hmm. They'll feed on the roots of your your ornamentals. They'll Hostas, feed on the yeah. bark of your yeah. trees, fruit trees. Oh, they're a major problem for uh, Jones Orchard. Yeah. You know, they can wipe out a, a peach tree planting by by having a colony of voles under every peach tree just about. Wow. Mm. So, so they're a severe problem. And uh, they will use now, they will use tunnels that exist. So they will use a mole tunnel. Uh, they, they, do, they do construct some of their own tunnels, but they will also use, and that's why there's so much confusion compar yeah. you know, mm -hmm. uh, comparing moles to voles. But they, there's, voles are sometimes called uh, uh, field mice. They have a short tail as opposed to the, the house mouse right. that we've got, the white-footed mouse that has a, has a long tail. But they, they live outside, and, and you can control them with rodenticides that are labeled for use inside and, and around dwellings. You can use rodenticides. You can use also uh, the same kind of traps mm -hmm. that you use, you know, mouse traps. Mouse trap. mm -hmm. uh, build a better mouse trap than you know, catch moles, <laughs> you know. Uh, but uh, that's the best way to control voles. But understand that there's a difference. Voles can actually kill your plants. Yes. Moles are simply an indicator of, of a healthy soil mm -hmm. environment. They can physically, you know, if they go under the roots of a plant, they might cause that to dry out a little yeah. bit. So that physical presence can, can might create you a few problems uh, under, under, you know, some of your annuals, maybe, yeah. and things like that, but by causing it to dry out a yeah. lot quicker. But... Uh, the, the moles are not going to cause any significant problems to your plant material. Okay. Moles, on the, the other hand, can kill plants. Can kill plants. And right. that, another trick that I've seen a lot of gardeners do, in fact, I've done it myself, is when you plant a new hosta, for example, because they love hostas, is uh, put a tin, take the bottom out of a tin can and set it in the soil to act as a barrier. Right. And, and I've used uh, edging, metal edging around, say, a tree, and you could actually see where they'd come up to that edging and you could see a burrow oh, right. around it, but they didn't get into the, the main roots. Hmm. So that's a good idea. Physical barriers okay. will okay. work sometimes. 
Okay. Yeah. And I almost forgot snakes. Yeah, rat snakes. Yeah. Rat snake. Recruit rat snakes to your area. They got to eat. They love they voles. They got to eat too. They love voles <laughs> as much as they love chipmunks. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Voles, Mr. D. That's all we have time for today. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us a letter or an email with your gardening questions. Send your email to familyplot at wknl.org. The mailing address is Family Plot, 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next time for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid South. Be safe. Funding for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid South is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation, the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you.